The F-105B is a high-performance fighter bomber capable of carrying special weapons internally to facilitate delivery at maximum speed. At maximum gross weight in the clean configuration, takeoff run is about 3,000 feet. From brake release to 40,000 takes 2 minutes 42 seconds. The Pratt & Whitney J-75 power plant is rated at 15,000 pounds dry and 23,500 with afterburning. This gives a power weight ratio at takeoff of 1.4 to 1. In contrast, the F-84F has a ratio of 2.4 to 1. Like other contemporary fighters, the 105 has a high concentration of longitudinal mass in relation to lateral mass. This means that motions due to inertia are more likely to couple with motions due to aerodynamic forces and produce violent gyrations. Whether or not this coupling is serious depends upon basic airplane configuration and stability characteristics. Directional stability was built into the 105 by using a ventral fin for effectiveness at high angles of attack and providing enough vertical area to compensate for conditions at high Mach numbers. Longitudinal stability and freedom from pitch-up are provided by the low stabilator position. The relatively high wing places the wake center lines progressively further from the stabilator as angle of attack increases. During flight test, an angle of 20 degrees has been reached. These stability characteristics, together with power loading, make it possible at low supersonic speeds for the airplane to hold or tighten a turn without losing speed. An actual history of a wind-up turn shows G's increasing to 5 while angle of attack increased to 10 degrees at a constant Mach number of 1.45. The flight test program has thoroughly investigated airplane stability and indicates that enough has been built in to provide a good weapons platform which is free from pitch up and inertia coupling. The level flight speed envelope has been extended beyond predicted values at some points. Maximum Q reached in the extension test to design dive speed is 800 knots indicated at 6,000 feet. The high speed and kinetic energy involved create a deceleration problem. This has been minimized by extremely effective speed brakes, which make possible steep subsonic dives in addition to reducing the time required to slow down for safe emergency ejection. The rugged structure required for high Q fighter bomber performance also provides pilot protection during this deceleration period without reliance upon complicated ejection devices. Assuming 550 knots indicated to be safe pilot exposure speed, it takes 10 seconds to decelerate from Mach 2 level flight. Longest times are from design dive speed, with 17 seconds required to slow down from 1.9 to 550. The same high kinetic energy, however, has taken the airplane to 63,000 feet, still going Mach 1.3 after a zoom climb with burner cut at 60. Calculations made using afterburner all the way indicate a 70,000 foot potential. This indicates that energy will be available at 62 or 3 for a firing pass at a supersonic bomber. Slow speed handling characteristics are also good and the airplane has been landed with a 2300 foot ground roll. For supersonic air induction, the design must consider the reversal of flow behavior. At subsonic speeds, compression causes higher velocities, but in supersonic flow, compression reduces velocity. Supersonic flow also changes velocity through shock waves, either oblique and weak, or of most concern, strong normal shocks perpendicular to flow which are characterized by subsonic speed downstream and a large pressure loss, the magnitude of which depends upon the upstream speed at which the shock occurs. 
If we did not prevent this normal shock from occurring at airplane velocity, a Mach 2 design would probably not reach that speed since only 72% pressure could be recovered downstream. If we first slow upstream speed to about 1.4, however, 96% recovery is possible. The F-105 uses a novel swept forward intake to compress the air and slow down velocity before allowing the normal shock to occur. In the more conventional cheek duct arrangement, the air is first compressed outboard and then turned back to the engine, thus losing some efficiency. The 105 intake compresses air inboard only. This allows a thin root section giving less drag and reducing vortex effect on the stabilator. A sliding plug positioned automatically according to Mach number provides the correct rate of air deceleration. Fuselage bleed doors positioned by Mach number, air temperature and angle of attack provide the means of spilling excess air to match engine requirement with inlet area, thereby controlling shockwave position. This prevents excess air from shocking over the wing, creating drag. In effect, inlet air is compressed and slowed down before the normal shock is allowed to occur, and the shock wave is positioned by controlling expansion on the subsonic side. Another air inlet in the 105 is in the vertical fin. This inlet directs cooling air into the aft section. When this air reaches the ejection nozzle, it is at comparatively low velocity and high pressure. Therefore, it acts as the divergent section of a convergent divergent nozzle. This reduces fishtail effect and base drag. The fire control system for the 105 has been flying in a modified RF-84F for about two years in accordance with a weapon system development concept. It furnishes the capability for both gunnery and rocketry, either air-to-air -air or air-to-ground, plus dive, level, and labs bombing modes. The versatility of the system produced an average CEP of 1,000 feet in the high-toss IP mode and 280 feet in the radar-ranging low-toss. A central air data computer feeds the fire control system. It also actuates flight control, making the 105 an integrated weapon system capable of automatic flight to the target, semi-automatic ordnance delivery, with a future capability of fully automatic store delivery. The first store drop program was conducted by Special Weapons Center personnel. Repeated, predictable, and accurate drops were made. In addition to labs deliveries, level ejections were made at speeds from 0.9 to 1.73. Faster capabilities will be explored at Eglin, where the program is now underway. During ground tests of the T-171 gun, long bursts at the 6,000 round per minute design rate produced dangerous gun gas concentrations which limited air firing through short bursts. A redesigned purging system is being tested at Eglin. The weapon system would not be complete without due regard for maintainability. Many features have been built into the airplane to aid in this work. Wherever possible, similar equipment has been grouped in bays with large access doors. Mach 2 equipment, however, requires extensive specialized training. Toward this end, over 227 military personnel have already been trained in the various phases of maintenance. To help them in their job, special tools and ground handling equipment are concurrently available. The flight test program, in which many Air Force pilots have been involved, has not disclosed any basic configuration deficiencies. Several mechanical problems have been corrected during flight test, and other hardware changes are being phased into the test inventory. Tactical Air Command is now scheduled for three aircraft in October 1958.
the 105A was first flown in October 1955 and has accumulated well over 100 flights. It is presently being used to evaluate systems operations, such as the emergency hydraulic powered by a ram air turbine, which furnish satisfactory control power at landing and at supersonic speeds with engine cut. It has also successfully completed a drop program conducted by Special Weapons Center personnel. Both bluff and turnaround shapes have been dropped at speeds ranging from Mach 0.9 to 1.3 and altitudes from 8,000 to 35,000 feet. The ejection mechanism is pneumatic with an initial force of 8,000 pounds. A lab's release was also accomplished at Mach 0.92 and 4 Gs. Results of the program prove that repeated, predictable, and accurate ejections can be made at supersonic speeds. The B airplane will be used to further extend the speed regime. Pitch-up has been investigated by both company and Air Force pilots, and apparently the low stabilator has eliminated the problem. The B airplane was forced to make a belly landing on its first flight, due primarily to a nose gear retraction speed far faster than any experienced during hundreds of ground retraction tests. This excessive speed made the uplock system malfunction and the nose gear could not be extended. By December 1st, however, many modifications resulting from the A program were incorporated and a total of 22 flights were accomplished. Emphasis has been placed upon evaluation of flying characteristics such as stability and control, thermodynamic measurements to finalize the variable air inlet scheduling, and a gradual extension of top speed. Ultimate objective, of course, is to demonstrate ability to perform the tactical mission for which the weapon system was designed. This mission profile permits delivery of a special store 900 nautical miles from base and return with adequate fuel reserve. Utilizing a 105 buddy tanker, operating from the same base, only one in-air refueling will extend this radius almost 50%. This buddy system is based upon a standard 450-gallon external tank modified to carry a drogue and necessary actuating gear along with 230 gallons of fuel. This is carried on the centerline pylon and the standard Bombay ferry tank is also used. All fuel can be transferred except that necessary for tanker to return to base. Optimum hookup is expected to be at 300 knots indicated at 32,000 feet. This extension puts effective radius well over 1300 nautical miles. In-air refueling, together with the dispersion possibilities offered by the Zell system, make possible some interesting operations analyses. The fire control system for the 105 has been flying for about one and one half years in a modified RF-84F. Bombing modes were essentially completed by December 1st and a production unit will be installed in the second B, expected to fly in January. Further development of the system is expected to provide automatic labs capability. Data reduction so far gives every indication of a successful and timely production installation. 50% of all drops made at Eglin were within 500 feet CEP 
and 75% were within 700 feet. Capability is provided for both gunnery and rocketry, air-to-air -air and air-to-ground, plus dive, level, and labs bombing. The ASW-10 automatic flight control system has also been under development at GE since 1954. Basic requirements were revised four times by a Republic GE WADC design team, and the present system has now been approved for production installation. An F-84F was used for stringent component testing. Flight tests in the 105 will start in the spring of 1957 when an air data computer becomes available. Both the A and the B airplanes were flown by Air Force pilots at very early stages and throughout the flight test program. The number of flights per month and total Air Force flights indicate good progress. After phase two tests on the A, Air Force pilots made 29 recommendations. 17 of these have already been incorporated in test airplanes seven will be in early production airplanes, and the remaining five are in areas where solution will be made prior to delivery to tactical units. In the clean configuration, the B takes off in less than 3,000 feet, and best performance climb speed is about 1.2. True top speed has been extended over Mach 2 and the variable air inlet pressure measurements now being obtained will permit optimum positioning of inlet plugs and bleed doors to attain best pressure recovery for fast acceleration and more speed. At the present, all indications point toward a successful program. Capable of releasing the special store at an indicated airspeed of 750 knots, the F-105B weapon system is now being evaluated by the Tactical Air Command. During the past 18 months, over 600 flying hours have been accumulated on test inventory aircraft at Republic and ARDC flight test centers. Functional tests have been accomplished with basic airframe systems such as speed brakes, refueling probe, and the ram air-driven emergency hydraulic pump. Engine air starts have been made at 25,000 feet and afterburner relights as high as 50,000 feet. In-flight refueling capability has been demonstrated with KB-50 tankers flying at indicated airspeeds of approximately 220 knots at altitudes of 20,000 feet. With the Republic-designed buddy system, refueling can be accomplished at Mach 0.9 at 35,000 feet. The unsatisfactory lateral control feel of the early airplanes has been corrected by the installation of a redesigned control system which has a much greater mechanical stiffness. The level flight velocities attained to date have approached or exceeded the supersonic speeds for which the F-105B was designed. A speed of Mach 1.22 has been reached at 4,400 feet, Mach 1.56 at 19,500 feet, Mach 2.01 at 35,000 feet, and Mach 2.01 at 40,000 feet. The maximum indicated airspeed attained thus far has been 800 knots at an altitude of 6,500 feet. This speed was reached in a shallow dive and corresponds to a dynamic pressure or Q of 2,200 pounds per square foot. The design Q for the 105 is 2,500 pounds per square foot. For minimum landing distance and maximum tire and brake life, 
The 105B is provided with a 20-foot drag chute. For additional improvement, an anti-skid brake system is being developed. Functional reliability has been established for the chute, but difficulty is being experienced with the anti-skid system at speeds below 50 knots. The Goodyear system originally tested is being modified to incorporate a brake pressure modulator, which will provide gradual brake reapplication during anti-skid cycles, thereby obtaining effective braking and alleviating pitching and excessive gear walking. The static test model is currently undergoing structural evaluation at the Wright Air Development Center. Thus far, the wing and fuselage have been successfully tested to limit load for the most critical flight condition, which is 7.3 Gs at Mach 1.2 at 24,000 feet. The stabilator structure, control system, and landing gear struts have been successfully tested to ultimate load. Ultimate load is 50% greater than limit load and is that load at which failure can occur. Structural integrity flight demonstrations are scheduled to begin during the latter half of 1958. The 8th F-105 will be used for this program. Instrumentation to record structural loads and air pressure distribution at selected stations is currently being installed. The 9th F-105 was assigned to the Extreme Temperature Evaluation Program. Instrumentation to record over 300 parameters was incorporated into this airplane during production, the recording components being installed in a Bombay pod. While instrumentation was being installed, low temperature functional tests of hydraulic actuators revealed a leakage problem at temperatures below minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. To avert leakage during the test program, a newly developed seal was retrofitted throughout the hydraulic system. On October 7, 1957, the airplane was placed into the Climatic Projects Laboratory at Eglin Air Force Base. Functional checks were conducted at temperatures down to minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Since only a few minor problems developed during the entire six-week test period, the airplane was considered well qualified for the Arctic operation phase of the low temperature evaluation program. On February 1st, 1958, the airplane departed for Isleson Air Force Base, Alaska. At Isleson, aircraft maintenance was performed on the flight line. A total of nine flight hours were accumulated during the 10 missions flown, one turnaround being accomplished within 12 minutes. Differential braking, in conjunction with nose wheel steering, provided adequate maneuverability for taxiing and parking on snow-covered surfaces. The average takeoff run in the clean configuration on hard-packed snow-covered runways was 2,600 feet. As the lowest surface temperature encountered was only minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, present plans are to conduct additional tests during the 1958-59 test season. To provide the highest possible speeds for delivery of the special store, along with an element of mission security, the F-105 fighter bomber was designed to carry the store internally. The bomb bay doors retract inwardly to provide minimum drag and buffeting at supersonic store delivery speeds. Internal store releases are accomplished by means of a unique ejection mechanism which utilizes a pneumatic cylinder to provide a 19,000 pound ejection force. This ejection mechanism is also used as a bomb hoist, thereby facilitating store installation. Nine special store releases have been accomplished to date from the F-105B. 
These releases were at various points within the flight envelope and exhibited excellent separation characteristics. Representative speeds were Mach 1.73 at 40,000 feet, Mach 1.59 at 27,500 feet, and Mach 1.22 at 4,400 feet, the Q at this point being 1,900 pounds per square foot. One of the releases was an over-the-shoulder toss with entry at an altitude of 500 feet at Mach 0.87 and roll out after a 4G pull-up at an altitude of 19,000 feet at Mach 0.55. Pilots report that above 400 knots indicated, a mild buffet exists with open Bombay doors. The buffet is not objectionable, nor does it change with increase in airspeed to 750 knots indicated. There is no trim change at store ejection, but a slight jolt can be felt. For defense against enemy aircraft, as well as strafing of ground targets, such as missile sites, the F-105B incorporates the M61 Vulcan gun which is capable of firing 20 millimeter ammunition at the rate of 6,000 rounds per minute. Early design information indicated that with a proposed gun installation, excessive gun gas concentrations would not develop in the gun area. Initial firing tests, however, revealed an excessive gas accumulation throughout the nose compartment. After considering various methods of eliminating this gas, an air ejector type purging system was designed. This system consists of a gun barrel shroud, an air ejector pump, a one and one half inch purge line from the gun barrel shroud, and a three inch purge line from the vicinity of the gun breech. The air ejector pump, a simple device without any moving parts, is capable of evacuating any gaseous mixture from the nose compartment at the rate of 30 pounds per minute. It consists of a mixing chamber and a converging diverging nozzle. It functions by utilizing high pressure air from the engine to entrain the air in the mixing chamber, thereby creating a secondary flow through the purge lines and exhausting overboard any gun gas and air mixture that may be present in the nose compartment. Gun firing tests at Edwards Air Force Base revealed that after a 200 round burst at a gun rate of 5,600 rounds per minute, over 15 seconds of purging time was required to clear the nose compartment of gun gas contamination. Additional research disclosed that blast tube choking was occurring and gun gases were being forced down open barrels of the gun and into the nose compartment. Tests with a modified blast tube indicated a lower gas accumulation and a complete redesign was undertaken to reduce blast pressure at the gun muzzles to a minimum. Gun firing tests with a redesigned blast tube showed a considerably smaller quantity of gas in the nose compartment after a 200 round burst and complete purging within two seconds. To further reduce the quantity of gas entering the nose compartment, a ring seal was installed at the aft end of the blast tube to improve sealing with a muzzle stabilizer. Satisfactory performance, the present installation has been demonstrated at subsonic speeds and altitudes up to 20,000 feet. These tests were conducted with 350 round bursts at gun rates in excess of 5,600 rounds per minute. Firing tests at supersonic speeds and altitudes up to 45,000 feet are currently being conducted at Eglin and thus far indicate satisfactory performance. Functional tests of the canopy jettison and seat ejection systems were performed at Republic prior to first flight of the 105. 
Further evaluation of the escape system was conducted under surveillance of Coleman Engineering at the ARDC supersonic sled facility located at Hurricane Mesa, Utah. The first test was conducted at 160 knots. Failure of a seat catapult test fitting, however, reduced the ejection force, resulting in a tail clearance of only three feet. The second test at 160 knots demonstrated excellent escape system performance, a tail clearance of 50 feet being obtained. Satisfactory escape system performance was also demonstrated at 540 knots. However, the right armrest failed shortly after ejection. The seat trajectory at this speed indicated a tail clearance of approximately seven feet. The peak transverse deceleration of the dummy and seat was 54 Gs. The final test was conducted at a speed of 750 knots, or Mach 1.2. The results indicated that survival would be unlikely. Now in production, these F-105B supersonic fighter bombers will soon be delivered to operational squadrons of the Tactical Air Command. During December 1957, a mock-up of the F-105D was inspected by a group of Air Force representatives. While retaining the combat capability of the B, the D will incorporate search and ranging radar as well as integrated flight instruments to provide the pilot with a blind air-to-air -air and air-to-ground attack capability. The radar will also indicate terrain clearance and with radar map corrections will permit Doppler navigation to the target area with minimum error. To accommodate the new radar equipment, the nose was lengthened 15 inches and a linkless ammunition feeder installed. The flight plan for a tactical bombing mission against a target 707 nautical miles distance would be take off and climb to 30,000 feet at Mach 0.83, drop the fuselage tank when empty and cruise at Mach 0.82 for one hour 18 minutes, climb to 37,500 at 0.87, drop wing tanks and pylons when empty and accelerate to 1.38 deliver the store and escape with a sea level run at 0.99 for two minutes, climb to 35,000 at 0.91 and cruise for 27 minutes at 0.86, climb to 40,000 at 0.91 and cruise to base at 0.87. The F-105E, a two-place version of the D, will have the same combat capabilities at a small reduction in speed and range. The prototype models of both D and E are currently being assembled. First flight for the D airplane is scheduled for July 1959 with the E following later that year. In a brief ceremony on May 27, 1958, Mundy Peel, President of Republic, presented the 12th F-105 produced to General Wyland, Commander of the Tactical Air Command. Mr. Peel, men and women of Republic Aviation, distinguished guests, 
it gives me a tremendous amount of satisfaction to accept this uh, first production unit of the F-105 uh, Thunder Chief on behalf of the United States Air Force and of the Tactical Air Command. Shortly after the ceremony, Lieutenant Colonel Scott, commander of the 335th Tactical Fighter Squadron, departed for Eglin Air Force Base, where TAC pilots will conduct the operational suitability phase of the F-105 Weapon System Evaluation Program. I grew up in Bremen, Georgia, about an hour west of here. Graduated from high school there. Came to Georgia Tech in 1952. Met Pat Epps along the way. We graduated in 1956. I had been accepted for pilot training with the Air Force after ROTC, but it was delayed for a year on that to go on active duty. So I worked for Lockheed out here in Marietta. And then in 1957, I entered pilot training down in Bainbridge, Georgia. I was very fortunate, flew the first group that flew the T-37. Went from there to Laredo, Texas, T-33, and got my wings. Came back to Moody Air Force Base flying F-86Ls. What, what put you on a track to go on ROTC and then into the Air Force? Is that something you wanted to do since you were a kid? or what, When did that <clears throat> kick in for you? Well, growing up during World War II, formative years, I heard about these guys flying tigers running around China, strafing trains and doing things in the big raids. And I thought, that must be really neat. And I never thought I'd get a chance at it until I got to Tech and found out there was ROTC and that I could have a chance. And, and what, uh, what made you choose Tech? <sighs> Probably because of the football team right then. Plus, my next-door neighbor was a ham radio operator, and he convinced me that if I went to tech and got an electrical engineering degree, my future was secure. At, at what point in your Air Force career did you get introduced to the F-105? I was in graduate school in Southern California in 1965-66. And while I was there, I was thinking, I'm going to miss out on this war because I had a lot of friends that already had assignments. But I received an assignment at the time uh, during, before I finished out there for the 105. And the sequence of events was I'd go to survival school at the completion and then to Nellis Air Force Base and check out in the 105 to go to Tok Lee, Thailand. So when you were at Nellis, how often did you get into Las Vegas? <laughs> I, surprisingly, I didn't go down there as much as you'd think during that time. Uh, we were pretty busy. I, I went out a few times to make sure I wasn't going to win any extra money. Tell, tell me as much as you can remember about your journey to Vietnam. How did they get you over there? Did, did, you, did you fly an airplane over there or did they ship you some other way? Just tell us about going to Vietnam and your first impressions of, of being there. Okay. I left from Fort Walton Beach, Eglin Air Force Base, in uh, the end of March 1967. I flew commercially to San Francisco and then up to Travis Air Force Base, where I was on a military contract flight that island hopped to the Philippines, uh, Clark Air Base, and I went through Jungle Survival School there for about 10 days. And then I flew again on a contract flight uh, to Bangkok and then on a military airplane, C-47, the old Goonie Bird, up to Tok Lee. And what, what do you remember about stepping off an airplane for the first time? In, in I had a very memorable introduction. The fellow who was the ops officer for my squadron and the one that became my flight commander subsequently said, welcome to the 354th. 
the highest loss rate squadron in Southeast Asia. So, yeah, what a good deal. And about a week later, I went up and met with the wing commander who welcomed the new people. And he told us that in two years of operation, the track record was in the 100 missions or one year tour, you had a 50-50 chance of being shot down. If you were shot down, you had a 50-50 chance of being rescued. Welcome to the war. You know, most pilots are in love with the airplane that they flew, but what, I mean, some of those loss rates had to do with the airplane you were flying, correct? Uh, the loss rate, I think, was primarily the mission. But backing up, uh, when I was in graduate school and new people were getting assignments, I had volunteered or indicated an interest in every airplane in Southeast Asia except the F-105. And that was based on a briefing from uh, Colonel Yeager when he was head of the test pilot school. He described it as an electronic monster, can't understand why the Air Force <laughs> wasted their money on this thing. So I was not particularly happy when I got my assignment. But by the time I checked out in the airplane and started flying it, I started to really like it. By the time I left to go to war, I won't say I was in love with it, but I was proud I was flying it. And the more I flew it, the prouder I was. But our mission, since we only flew in North Vietnam, made us extremely vulnerable. We, did, we didn't have much, uh, what we say, milk runs. Maybe on a bad weather day, you'd do a recce down in rec Route Pack 1, north of the DMZ. And that was pretty easy, but I was on my 47th mission and 31 of them were in the Hanoi area. I'd already beaten the odds two or three times. I never got to meet Colonel Oles, but he was the commander of the 8th Wing over at Ubon when I was flying, and they flew MIG cap on several missions into Hanoi that I was on. But I did not meet him personally until, we, until after the war. So, uh Obviously, your, your missions were into dangerous territory, and I've read that, um, well, I won't get into reasons, but because of our unwillingness to stop the stuff coming in from the Russians, they had a very robust anti-aircraft defense system. So uh, I imagine every mission was just tremendously high risk. There were a few missions, like the uh, when we would do road recce or just general reconnaissance missions down in the lower route packs one, two, or three. That were all you almost say were fun, go out and roam around and see the countryside while you were doing it. But yes, when we went into the Hanoi area, uh, the expression was when you get up there, your ass belongs to Uncle Sam. Put those bums on target. And there were some missions that. Everything is there. You're, we went in, at the time I was there, we'd make run-ins at low altitude, around 1,500, 2,000 feet, to try to stay out of the radar for the sounds uh, and, uh, and the radar guns. Therefore, small arms fire was a risk that you had to avoid. But you know, in the pattern that we flew, we'd pull up to about 14,000 feet and then come back in on a dive. And that's when the radar could pick you up where the first month or so I was there where the MiGs would be laying for us right over Hanoi and and one mission I was on we had MiGs going up with us in the pop. We had 105s and MiGs and 105s and MiGs and Sam's going off and flak all around. I don't, I don't know who the MiG leader was that day but he wasn't too smart. <laughs> Oh, you could almost watch a gauge drop. I used I used to laugh. Say, so put your hand on the floorboards, you could feel it going by. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, typical fuel consumption was probably about three thousand gallons or pounds an hour, and the afterburner jumped to six to six point, a little over six thousand. So you didn't do that unless you meant it. No. <laughs> The, the best I did, I guess I got it about 1.3 or 4. 
But that's an interesting story if you want to put on it. Yeah, go <laughs> so, ahead. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> we were on a mission on Sunday afternoon in a, a, a railroad yard just northeast of Hanoi across the, the uh, Red River Bridge there. And <clears throat> my flight leader, we were the number one bomb flight, and there was a flak suppression flight ahead of us, and the number four guy there had been hit and was going down under the clouds with about a 2000 dot. A level 2,000 foot level layer and so my flight leader says I'm gonna follow him down so that meant me leading the, the mission out and about the time I got and got to recover right across Hanoi and that's where we were in afterburner accelerating out of there and jinking a SAM went off so close that I flew through the colored cloud which only lasts a couple of seconds and I came back and I told him that day, I said, I think the biggest damage I did was going across Hanoi supersonic, blowing out all the windows in town. <laughs> but as we got out, I was starting to climb out, and a fellow from up here in Georgia who happened to be in my squadron too, got to recognize his voice, called me and he says, single 105, 18 east of 97, shake it, you got a MIG on you. So I did a split S right down through the cloud layer pulled up and when I did and looked out there was a mountain ridge on either side of me out here at least 500 feet higher than me and I came back out of there rather subdued to say the least and I remember I got back and went through debriefing and intelligence at that time if you had a tough mission they'd pull out this bottle of bourbon old overholster I remember and they'd give you a shot and I Threw that one down, and I started telling him about the mission. He pulled us, you like another one? <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> and I says, can I have another one? <laughs> I had my third shot of bourbon. We got through the debrief, and I looked at my watch. It was about five minutes till the evening church time. And I went down to the chapel, and I knew this Methodist minister was down there, and I leaned up and right up in his face. I said, it was a close one today, but he got me back here. I said, you think I'll be okay here? He says, you'll be glad you're here. Come on in. But that was probably my most exciting day, other than being shot down. I, I guess a day you probably don't enjoy talking about, but I hope you will, July 5th, 1967. And, and maybe... Um, you know, I'd love for people who, particularly young people, to understand what your day was like. Not just the fact that you were shot down, but your usual day and preparing for a mission. And all you can remember about that day would be wonderful. I don't have any trouble talking about it. July the 5th, 1967 was obviously a very special day. And two or three things led, led up to that. And that I had just been appointed or signed as the executive officer of the squadron and we were having an inspection we had a new commander he asked me to do a check around to make sure we were ready and get acquainted myself so i had not flown for three days i i had sat as spare when i need when they needed but i didn't get off and i remember on the night of the fourth of july i wrote a letter home and i said well i missed the fireworks again today but fergie promised me tomorrow for sure and sure enough i went out um, the afternoon mission. I dropped that report off on the commander's desk and headed out. And later on, talking to people in Hanoi when we were together, almost without exception, all of us acknowledged there was something different about the way we felt that day. We couldn't put our finger on it, but it didn't, it, it wasn't like a normal day. And I kept trying to think the whole time, what have I forgotten? What did I do or not, not do or what? And as it turns out, obviously it was that sense, I guess, of, of the impending, what was Im imminent. But in my case, <clears throat> I was uh, the number four airplane in a second flight on a railroad siding right up near the Chinese border. And just as we started our rollout of the first flight, there was a call for MIGs about 20 miles west of us at our altitude. So as number four, that's part of my responsibility. So I took a quick look out there to see if I could pick them up. And I didn't see anything, but when I looked back, my leader, 
had already started rolling in, and the flak was so thick that I couldn't see down, so I had to stay up until some bombs went off and I could see the target. Consequently, I had to adjust my roll-in. Instead of being in a 45-degree dive, I was probably at least 60 coming straight down, and I had to adjust the altitude, drop the bombs. And I flew through three levels. They were laying out flak at, at level three, about 3,000 feet apart. I made it through the thr three of the levels of flak, but just as my bombs came off, I felt a hit. I'd been hit twice before, so it was unmistakable. But this time, <clears throat> my procedure was when I dropped the bombs, was hit the afterburner, pull out, let that give me the thrust, and start my jinking. Well, when I hit the afterburner, the airplane just did a tumble. And I came back out, it stabilized, and I, whew, I remember this distinctly. Boy, that'd be a heck of a ride at Coney Island. I'd never been there, but I'd heard about it. So I relaxed, put the burner back in, get out of here, and the airplane just started flipping and tumbling. And I couldn't see out because of the flames, but I was still gonna try to make it as close as I could to the water. We'd come in off the gulf and we're going back out that way. But about that time, the, the uh, camera up in front of the dash, under the windscreen, broke loose and I had to duck as it went over my head, and as I was looking, the S-butt panel just started crumbling, and the airplane was starting to come apart. So I leaned back, put myself in position, pulled the handles, and I remember thinking nothing happened. And boom, it's gone. And I had a very interesting experience in that I grayed out. I couldn't see anything, didn't feel anything. I was just kind of floating. I thought I was dead, literally. And then I started feeling some pressure and my vision started coming back and I could see a little bit of green and then all of a sudden I could see the canopy of you know the tops of the trees and I'm coming down and I looked up to see if the canopy was open and it was just starting to blossom and I reached up to get it and when I put my hands on the risers they collapsed I was sitting on a log on the ground and that all took less than two seconds because I had those automatic systems that got me out, pulled the chute, not worked, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. I figure I went out inverted in negative Gs and probably maybe even ejected toward the ground, I don't know, no idea. But somebody up there was looking out for me that day again, like the day that over Hanoi Supersonic. You're not any place you wanna be. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the first thing, obviously, that I did once I was on the ground sitting on the log, my par my emergency beeper was going off, get that off so I can talk. But I couldn't get up to it, I couldn't get it cut off. I didn't think. I realized after the fact that I had, because two others had been shot down, and their beepers were the ones that were going off blocking things. But I made an immediate call, told them I was down safe, I'd check in in an hour. <laughs> That's really optimistic. <clears throat> but sitting on the log looking down was kind of a runny. I looked down and looked at trees. This is just like North Georgia. Those hills, same kind of scrub trees and pine tree in the room of the ground gravelly. Then all of a sudden it dawned on me. These ain't gonna be friendly North Georgia's <laughs> mountaineers. Everybody I see now may be looking to kill me. So I started trying to get rid of stuff. My chute was caught in the trees. I couldn't get it down. My survival kit had, that comes out separately had banged down and I couldn't get it open. But I could get a side open that had the jungle hat with a mosquito in it and a bottle, two cans of water. And I pulled out the water, stuck them in my, my flight suit, and put the hat on, threw my helmet down the hill, hoping that would make them think I'd gone that way. And I started up the hill, which was the instructions, the recommendations from survival school. And as I got to almost to the top of the hill, and I could see a, a path out here that I was going to go to, I hesitated just long enough. My, I think, actually, my G-suit got caught in some brambles and kept me from pushing these bushes open. And a Vietnamese ran across closer than four feet away. The only thing, he was in a hurry or didn't look my way. So that caused me to look around a little bit. 
and the path, and then I saw these field wires across the way. And I leaned up and looked. I'd come down right in the gun ring. There was a gun sight down here about 100 yards and another one over here about 100, 150. And so I reconsidered <laughs> my actions at this point, don't get too carried away. But I managed to get across that path without leaving a track with the boots. And I thought if I got over on the other side and down the hill, I could hide out for that hour and check in and maybe get picked up, get out of here. And I didn't realize when I got across, all the brush was over here. I was in grass, oh, maybe a foot, foot and a half high. And when I got to the edge and looked down, it was a drop off into a bog. I wasn't going anywhere in that direction. So I sat down and opened one of the cans of water. And at that point, I was so thirsty, I didn't think there was enough water around. I took two sips and I thought it was gonna come out my ears, all the psychological, the shock effects. But I managed to drink it, forced it down, threw the can away. And about that time, I heard voices that were gathering up over here along the trail. And they were pointing and talking. And I'd heard some shots and hollering back and forth. They'd obviously found my parachute and helmet. And so they'd eliminated that side. They just really were going to come over here. And they did, and they came out. And I did this and tried to get quite anything white out of sight and hide down. But I turned out I, I wasn't going to hide under anything. They walked up and tapped me on the shoulder and welcomed me to North Vietnam. The ones that came out and got me were actually militia. They were in civilian clothes. One of them had a rifle. Uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but these are regular North Vietnamese. This is no, 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 these are civilian. They're like militia. Oh, okay. They're in civilian clothes. Uh, I don't know how they fit into the system right right there then, but like I say, one of them had a rifle, and they started stripping me down. And, of course, when I got my pistol out over here, one of them pulls it out and looks at it. And I don't know why it was just a sixth sense. I just happened to glance up just as he was starting to come across and hit me in the head, and I ducked and missed him. And the guy with the rifle leaned across and hit him with a butt in his chest, knock him back. And I remember thinking, you and I are going to be friends. <laughs> I don't know about the others, but I like you. <laughs> but they packed me down. Well, they started me, walk, took off my boots, stripped out everything out of the flight suit. One amusing thing, I carried a half a pack of Salem's because we'd been told that Ho Chi Minh liked those. And if Ho Chi Minh did, most everybody else probably would. And I carried some Winston cigarettes, too. They pulled the cigarettes out, looked at them, crumbled them up, and threw them away. And I said, well, so much for intelligence. <laughs> but they started walking me, and I realized if I walked very far barefooted, my feet were not going to be in a condition to do anything else. So as we started down the trail, I started watching, and I found, saw a root coming up, and I hooked my foot in it and fell over and convinced them that I'd hurt myself when I got them to carry me all the way down the side of the mountain. And we stopped in a little village. They put me in, in a house in the back corner on a bed. And I was there, I'd say, between 30 minutes and an hour. Cause it, and he came in, tapped out, and walked back out. And I got in this, I called it a, a uh, uh, safari wagon. It was as bigger than a jeep, but not as big as you see safaris nowadays, but open vehicle with a canvas top. And they put me in the back seat, one guy on each side, they're holding my arms like this, I wasn't tied up. But I looked up as the fellow on my left in English said, you're now the prisoner of the Chinese Liberation Army. And what I saw in front was a picture of Mao Zedong and Lin Pao, head of the premier and the head of the People's Army. And I couldn't put my hand up and do the Marine salute, but I said something, well, okay, you really did it to yourself this time. Because I figured I was gone to, to China because we were that close to the border. I learned over the next 24 hours that that's why the gun sites were so good down there. The Chinese were running them all. And what we had rolled in over, literally, that got us was what we considered probably the best gun site in North Vietnam. Of course, now I knew why. And later, 
in 79 when uh, Deng Xiaoping came to this country, he acknowledged that they had 300,000 regular troops in North Vietnam for the war. So that's what they were doing. And it was also why we had been briefed about two or three weeks before that there would be no attempted rescues in the buffer zone right up near the border. That they finally acknowledged that those were the Chinese. And I'd have to say that overall, I was well treated with them. They brought me something to eat. They wanted me to do a, a radio broadcast, which I declined with no pressure. And that night, the commandant came in. They introduced him as the commandant. And through the translator said that if I cooperated with them, that I would be treated well and I'd be taken to Beijing and be treated well. And I declined that kind offer also. Because <laughs> in 1967, Beijing and the moon were about the same distance from Atlanta, Georgia, as far as I was concerned. I did not realize, did not know, I should say, that we had an F-104 pilot who had been shot down September 65 who was already in Beijing. And he came home when we did, and I introduced myself to him and told him my opportunity to meet him. He said, you made a good choice. He spent seven and a half years in solitaire. And after the, uh, during the 24 hours with the Chinese, when I knew, they took me around the next day to various gun sites. Uh, we'd stop someplace, and about eight or 10 guys would come out in uniform and line up. And I called him the cheerleader. And the head guy would get out his little red book, and he'd read and chant and read and he'd chant. And they, the, the translator then would say, the U.S. will surely be defeated. The v Vietnamese people will surely be victorious. Okay, that's nice. And one thing out of that, which really surprised me, was that almost every one of these guys had a camera. And when the chanting and cheerleading was all over, they'd all gang around, they're all making pictures. So I had my fingers crossed that somebody was going to make a picture to get out because I knew with my close call, I was probably going to be reported as killed in action. So I, I cooperated with the picture making at that point as much as possible. But <clears throat> the, that afternoon, they took me up to a place, I guess it was a, either a subordinate or a, a corresponding headquarters where I met some more regular army, and uh, I had, I guess you'd say, a uh, test of, of wills. They started the chanting again, and this time they wanted me to say it. And I told them, no, I'm not going to say that. And one of the guys, I don't know what they smoked, but his eyes showed he had something more, more than than the issue, maybe even old overholzer. <laughs> but he comes up with his rifle and puts the bayonet right under my chin and pops it up like that. Well, the translator's right here saying, you must say it. And I wouldn't shake my head, I just did kind of like that. And after two or three times like that, and for him saying, you must say it, I finally just did my lips tightly and grimmed, so I'm not gonna say that. And an officer obviously came up and got this guy to back off with a rifle. And, but I wasn't too sure there for a while because I could, I could see he, the rifle bore was clean. <laughs> it was operable. But once that was over, uh, back in the truck, back down to the where I'd been before, uh, in, a, in an area with a cave. But that was my, my house right then. And they let me take a nap. and. The uh, commandant, commander, came by and motioned like that and went out and got in the truck and went down and they turned me over to the North Vietnamese. And uh, I remember when they made that offer and to go to Beijing, I said, no, I want to go to Hanoi. The guy looked at me and just kind of shook his head. <laughs> so when they turned me over, I laid him back out and I wanted to shake hands with him, and we did which is part of the story because I hope to meet him later on. But anyway, the Vietnamese took me, blindfolded me, and took me down, I'm pretty confident, to Kemp Airfield. And I got a jet helicopter ride 
into Jelam, right downtown, and then a truck ride across the river to the big prison Wallow. We refer to Wallow as the Hanoi Hilton, oh, that's but, the but, Hanoi al Hilton. but also yeah. Hanoi Hilton tends to encompass all the camps. If you're in Hanoi, you're in the Hilton, oh. although everybody, with few exceptions, processed through the big prison initially. And I went into New Guy Village there, learned I wasn't nearly as big, mean, and tough, and strong as I thought I was. A couple of little fellas with a rope can get you to do and say things that you didn't plan to. And another one that uh, got my arms up behind me for the better part of a day, convinced me to do some things. It had been opened in, I think, uh, summer, June, July area of 66. And they called it the farm because out the edge of town and you could hear the chickens and the animals and things around and they named the buildings for things like the barn and the stable and the chicken coop and there were, it was an old French movie studio so it was a theater there that was obvious and they had a swimming pool and one was a pool hall so all those names fit in but one of the guys that was living in front of the pool hall <laughs> was a real character one day well Almost all the doors had these little openings, and we call them peephole, peeps, for short. And that's what they'd open up and look, check on you every morning and during the day or at night or whatever. One of the guards came by one day and did that. <laughs> After he walked off, this fella tapped his neighbor next door, says, this is the first zoo I've ever been in where the animals look at the people. <laughs> and from, from then on, it was the zoo. Uh, after the zoo, uh, sometime during the summer of 70, the Vietnamese were readying a new facility for us uh, at an existing army post out again to the west of Hanoi. <clears throat> and they had moved at least two groups in there earlier, one of them from the Hanoi I mean, from the Sante prison where the raid took place later on. But <clears throat> it was the first time we had had compound living, so to speak. It was a big, long barracks that was divided into several rooms. Excuse me. <clears throat> but after a few days, we were all out together. They'd come in just to unlock the doors in the morning. We had to run to the place till siesta time, when they'd put us back in for a couple of hours, and then we'd back out. We had to run to the place till time to lock up to go to bed. We had a latrine area and a wash shower area. It, it definitely, it, it was not Hogan's Heroes, <laughs> but it was so much better than anything we had had. We are getting sunshine, exercise, and then the Sante Raid popped in, and that was about six, seven miles away. We heard all the fireworks and see the airplanes and activity, and it scared the bejesus out of the Vietnamese. Two days later, we were all loaded up, now taken back down to the big prison, Wallow, downtown. And they had opened up an area in the back that we knew was back there because when I was there before, we could hear people back in there. They had been using it for political prisoners as well as South Vietnamese uh, prisoners they'd captured. And these cell blocks were roughly 25 feet by about 55 or 60. And they had up to 100, 100 to 120 South Vietnamese in each one, and there were 50 to 57 of us in each one. And on the concrete slabs, you had about that much space. And then had guys laying on bedboards around on the floor. It was a crowded sardine can, but it was so nice to be with people that you'd only heard names of for several years, but now you got a face to go with and a personality, and you got new people to talk to and new stories to hear. And it, it, it was actually fun for a few days. The first 
stop that I made when we went out to the zoo was in an area that we called the annex. It's, there was a series of buildings, I think there were nine or ten of them, where they stored the film from the studio. And in fact, there were old rolls of film around and so on. And I was in this group of, of uh, three other F-105 pilots that had been shot down in early October. We'd gotten there in late October. But none of us knew anything about the tap coat. We'd tried to talk across the wall or do something to the group that was next to us. There were two units in each building. But we weren't getting anywhere until this, the next spring, like March, this Navy lieutenant commander came in who knew the code. He had heard it, but he wasn't, hadn't had a chance to use it, wasn't very good at it. But we were over trying to get the guys next door to respond. And he was tapping on the wall and we were giving names and they were giving their names back. I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir, but uh, how did the code work? Was it a form of Morse code or? No. How, how did you, how'd you know which letter was, was what tap? <laughs> Well, the quick background is one of the very early Air Force officers, I think he was number six or seven, shot down, had been talking to a German POW, one of ours who was a, a German POW in World War II, and talked about this code. And Smitty asked him, what is it? Is it Morse code? No, it's a little matrix, five by five. Excuse me, you drop out the letter K because <clears throat> you can get the same sound using a C. It's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, right on down. And to tap it, you tap, the first tap is for the row, and the second tap is for the column. So a B would be one, two, two, and my initial W were one, two, three, four, five, dot, dot. Now, a, dot, dot. And it seems cumbersome till you get it and get going. And once you get established doing it, it's like, a lot of other things, you pick up a word from the context and you can get them to go on. And you, you can do it even faster than the telegraph key, I think. Uh, we used, it, it was a lifesaver for us. But this first effort was really cumbersome. <laughs> and when they were given their names back, this one came out, as I, as I mentioned, there's no K, you use the C. It came back H I C C E. So that doesn't make any sense. So you did an error and get him to do it again. And about the third time, I don't know why it popped in my mind. I said H I C, and then all of a sudden I remembered. Sink. Ask if that's Jim. And he went back. Jim it came back. Yes, and it's Jim Hickerson. And we had been fraternity brothers down here at Georgia Tech. Stood side by side at initiation. He went in the Navy right away when I had that delay at, at uh, Lockheed. But we'd seen each other about two years after both of us had our wings. But that that would have been 10 years later right there in Hanoi. But it was after he and I were then moved, as we call it, across the wall into the main prison. He was up in the barn and I was in the pool hall. So we didn't communicate until about uh, two years later when we had what I call a fruit basket turnover and he moved in next door to me and they'd taken some of the bricks out of the windows and I got to lean in and shake hands with him. But then when we went out to the to the uh, camp we call Faith at the compound living and then back into the other, we stayed together for the next two and a half, almost two years. Thinking about the whole experience, you had to go through a range of, uh, I, I shouldn't say you had to, I would imagine you went through a range of emotions. Definitely. At, in the beginning, you're, you're a new opportunity for them. And, and then there must reach a point where the enemy says, we've done everything with this guy that's of value to us we can do, and now you just become I shouldn't say just become. Now you're you're a prisoner. When you think back, I mean, there had to be fear, boredom, hunger. I mean, how do you describe the stages of, of your imprisonment and what it did to you? Well, <clears throat> first off was the startling realization that Air Force Intelligence at Survival School was out of touch with the real world. <laughs> because I asked the question, 
as, as part of the, the process, what do you know about the POWs? So you, you're probably aware of the Hanoi March that had happened in the summer of 66. <laughs> oh, and by the way, one of the Navy guys was shot down a couple of days before that happened, and they put him in. He got down and got to prison, and his quote was one of the famous ones. He said, you guys do this very often? <laughs> but I, I was concerned about it, and the sergeant told me in the Philippines, oh, we've had reports of really, really good treatment up there. I said, they've been seen out in town at night and in restaurants and theaters and stuff. <laughs> and I'd been there about a week when I settled down enough wish I could get my hands on that sergeant again. And uh, also uh, a, a Marine from world, from Korea. But anyway, <clears throat> I was not prepared for the immediate torture, to be candid. Uh, obviously, in survival school, we were taught name, rank, serial number, date of birth, according to the Code of Conduct, and evade further question to the best of your ability. But a German POW fellow, U.S. Air Force, who had been German POW when I was there, made the statement that if you have something that they want, they will get it. If you're by yourself, they'll get it out of you. If they're more than one, beware of things they'll do to play you off each other to get it. So once I got to the name, rank, serial number, date of birth, and they said, what was your target? And I said, I don't know. And he said, what do you mean you don't know? And, and his English wasn't that good, but I could understand it. But I used the fact that I couldn't to get him to repeat things to buy time to think about what I was doing and saying. But anyway, he let me know right away that name, rank, serial number is not going to cut it. Oh, in fact, that, that was one of the humorous things. I told you about faking that injury up in the mountain to get him to carry me. I tried the same thing with the Chinese. They brought in a doctor. He checked me out. He said, no, you're okay. I said, no, deep. no, you're okay. But I get to Hanoi. Now I'm in a new venue. So when the interrogator comes in, <laughs> he says, sit. And he was at a table with this light, little gooseneck thing down here with a stool down. He says, sit. So I start like I'm going to hobble over there. <laughs> he looks up and he says, maybe you best actor in survival school, but now you in Hanoi. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> that alerted me. This guy is not a dummy. He's he's in touch. And over the course of the night, he convinced me that their intelligence was immediately up to date. He asked me two questions over the course. One, I'd been briefed on it the day before I was shot down, and one, a day I was shot down as top secret. And he asked me why this happened. First one was why the MiG... Why do the 104, or the F-4s no longer fly MIG cap? And I said, you mean they weren't up there today? I thought they were. <laughs> and then he says, why can you not fly over Hanoi below 10,000 feet now? And we'd just been briefed on that that day because there's a French delegation in town. So once that confirmed that I got to be serious about this. And when he was asking these questions, what was your target? I, said, I don't know, I was a spare, got pulled in, I just followed them. Who, was in, who else was in your flight? I don't know. <laughs> Who's in your squadron? Well, I'm new, I've only been there a short time. <laughs> you know, he kept pressing for names, so I started coming up with guys from high school and from tech who were 4F or never in. A few, I threw in some names of guys that finished her mission and gone home to be good. And I kept cranking this, and finally, after I don't know how many hours, and several times of tying me up and me being pass, passing out and coming back to consciousness, he said, why do you keep lying? I said, I'm not lying. And he said, yeah, you lie. Same day you, we shoot down man 357 squadron, tells us everything. And I thought about that a minute, and I said, well, if he tells you, why do you ask me? He said, I want to hear you say. So we're back to the game again. <laughs> Name, rank, serial number, write down all the same questions. And I remember from survival school, if you're telling a lie and somebody else telling the truth, the liar's in trouble. <laughs> and I thought, oh, gosh, if he really did tell them, 
I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I started pulling my answers back to more factual things, but not quite as best I could, but sweating it out. And finally, when he quit about daylight, and this had started a little after dark the night before, and I got the day off and I lay there and they brought me some soup and rice to eat and I got to thinking, he really conned me. He played all those things they told me about in survival school. He did it and then I bought it. Hook, line. There ain't nobody else up here now. And I never heard any reference about another guy until I got to the zoo with those new 105 pilots. And one of the guys had been at the other base at Karat. And he said, Oh, he said, I knew about you. You were shot down the same day as Ward Dodge. And he was a flight leader in another squad. I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, he and another guy were shot down that day. They were 357th Squadron. So, yeah, they had the guy. He, they put him out. He died in captivity about a week later. And once I got through the fear, and, and I mentioned the next day, when, when I said, he really hooked me, uh, I got to shape up here and start earning my pay as a major in the United States Air Force. They came in the next morning and says, today you write your autobiography. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. That's Nikola Tunka. You won't write. <laughs> he said, I ordered you to. I said, well, I don't take orders from you. And, uh, none of these guys wore rank, so you didn't know who you were talking to really, but they all look like kids, as you know, Orientals tend to look much younger than they are for a long, long time. But we went through that and they said, well, I bring in a camp commander. He he orders you to write. I said, okay. So he goes, and, and I was really being this flippant and blase, no kidding. So he comes back in a few minutes with a guy about his age, same size. He says, now this is the camp commander. <laughs> and I said to myself, oh yeah, this was Saturday morning. I said, oh yeah, these guys were out drinking beer last night. They said, oh, we're gonna have some fun with a new guy. <laughs> He says, he asked, will you write your autobiography? I said, nope. He talked in Vietnamese. He says, he asked you one last time. I said, no. Now he's talking to me. He says, he orders you to write your autobiography. I said, I take my orders from the chief of staff of the United States Air Force. <laughs> and he talked a little more in Vietnamese, and he says, one more time? I shook my head. And the camp commander looks up in very good English and says, you will be very sorry. Got him walked out. Two or three minutes later, this big guy comes in, biggest Vietnamese I saw. And they put me on the ground, pulled my arms back up behind me. I couldn't do it again. My life depended on it. My palms were together behind my neck. I could scratch my neck. And they put Vietnamese handcuffs right there. And they walked out. And I thought, man, eh, this ain't a big deal. And about five minutes later, my hands were numb, my arms were numb, and shortly my shoulders were numb, and pretty soon my chest was numb. And so I started walking around so I could keep myself alert and active, I thought. Next thing I knew, I'm laying on the floor. <laughs> I'd obviously fallen like that. And I did that three or four times, so I just gave up, quit trying to walk around. And during the meal time, that meal time came, he came, comes in with a bowl of soup and a plate of rice and holds it up. And I said, oh, good. We're going to get a break here and get something to eat. He holds it up, and, or I'm sorry, sets it on the table. And he does that. And I shook my head. He walked over and picked it up and walked out. <laughs> hmm. Maybe they are serious about this. Okay, I'll lay here a while longer. So I guess I passed out off and on because the next time the afternoon meal time came he comes in with a suit and rice again sets it down to this and I said no but I had been conscious enough during the time that I realized I hadn't seen another American I've been here for four days now and this was the funny part I haven't felt my hands all day this is into the afternoon I haven't felt anything from my waist up for a good while if I can't use my hands I can't feed myself and I probably can't play golf again. <laughs> so when he starts to pick up the stuff to go away, I said, wait a minute. And he turns around, does that, and I said, I'll try. He picks it up. 
I said, okay. <laughs> he turned around and, uh, and nodded my head. He wouldn't leave till I said yes. So he left the suit, went out and got the officer, came back and the officer asked me, and I tried with him, I'll try. He shook his head, so I said, okay. So he takes the handcuffs off, and I'd been through rope tying up before, and when they do that, the whole purpose is to cut off circulation, and when they release it, it's like grabbing a, an electric wire if you've ever been shocked, you know, by house curl. Well, this time when he came off, I just shook all over. And <clears throat> they brought in a little booklet, like I never had it down here, but they called test booklets, you know, the little blue book sort of thing lined with a whole thing of questions, sit down and write. And so for about three or four days, I'd sit there and hold a pen in my mouth and push it around with my hands. And I'd get six or eight words on a page that way and use up stuff. And it was questions, what's your name? And I put it down, what's your father's name? I put daddy, what's your mother's name? I put mommy, <laughs> where were you born? I put early age, you know, just Mickey Mouse seat. I, I, I don't know, I, I guess I was so beaten down by this point I didn't really care what they did. <laughs> I was going to have some fun in the process. But they never referred to that again. And it proved, for me at least, the whole point was we can make you do it. What that sergeant had said, we'll show you that we run this camp. You'll do what we tell you to do. So from then on, as a game of how much I could keep them from, from doing it. And then that night, when you were asking, this was really my low point. When I ate that meal and realized that I had been broken. And so then over there, we had a big thunderstorm. It rained, and I was so thirsty. They hadn't given me any water, except the, when the interrogator would be there, and he'd have a cup and offer it. And I remember I got up, and I pulled the table over, put the chair on it, put the stool on it, and got up where I could get this vent, and reached out and got a hold of a limb on the tree so that the rain coming down and run down, and I'd get some water off my arm. And then it quit raining <laughs> about the time I got it. And so I went over and leaned up against the wall, just slumped down, and there was one light way over in the corner. And I looked up, and it, it just kept attracting my attention. And I remember thinking, it was like Moses in the burning bush, I guess. And I sat there and I looked at the light. And whether it was a split second or an hour, I can't tell you. But I had an experience of something happened to me and it was all over. I was feel very comfortable, very secure. You're gonna live, you're gonna get out of this and you'll go home someday. And from then on, I, I was able to accept things that happened and when it would be a crackdown right after escape in a night camp and other things that would come down, you'd have a little sense that this this might be bad. I'd, I could just think about it for a minute and I, I could feel comfortable again and go on and do what I had to do. And I could, I remember thinking Harry Truman made the statement as president that he had no trouble sleeping every night because he knew he had done the best that day that he knew to do and he needed his rest for the next day. And I realized that I was, I was able to do that. I could lie down every night and go to sleep no matter what was going on. And how long had you been a prisoner when that happened? I was shot down on Wednesday afternoon, and that was Saturday night. So three days. Th three days after you were shot down, you you feel you had a moment that gave you I won't call it peace, but gave you something that got you through the rest of those years. Yep. Was there a day in that prison camp after that that you didn't feel that awareness or didn't think about that, or did that sustain you? every single day. I can't say that I thought it consciously every day, but the feeling was there every day. And what do you think about that now? What do you think that was? It still sustains me. And the experience that I had there after we were in those large groups, we started after some confrontations with the Vietnamese, we started having Sunday church services. And 
I thought about it a lot. You know, what, is, what does this mean to me? What do I do? And I participated, not, not as an activist, but participated in the services, attended. And when I got home, I went to see another one of our classmates down here at Georgia Tech who had become an Episcopal minister. And I talked to him about it and asked him, you know, how did you make the transition? Because he had been a technical major. How did you make the transition to the Tome experience? And the first assignment I had when I got back uh, was at the Air War College. And one of my classmates there was a Catholic priest that I got to know fairly well. And I was still in this time, you know, I was saved in that ejection. I went through this other experience. What, what am I here for? And the Catholic priest let me put it in the best perspective. He said, don't try to solve the problem. He said, you, you go through your life looking for the sign or looking for this or what. And he said, you may miss what you're actually here for. He said, just accept the fact that you're here and make the most of it that you can. And that's, that's really what's been with me ever since. <clears throat> Not like five and a half, almost six years a prisoner. How did you find out you were going home and when you were going home? And tell me about that experience. Well, to put uh, it all in perspective, when Nixon started the bombing, again in May of 72. We were in the big prison there at Wallow. And <clears throat> somebody that went to quiz, as we called the interrogations, because it was easier to say and to tap, uh, brought back a message that uh, Nixon is crazy man. We don't know what happens now. But we had in our camp one South Vietnamese prisoner and three Thai prisoners who were allowed out to work and do things, and of course they were speaking the language, and they were they were really our intelligence. And we got a heads up that 209 was the number, literally, were gonna be moved out of camp. And sure enough, about a week later, 209 of us were moved right up to the Chinese border, deep in the mountains, and a camp that we thought initially was new to us. We learned later on that others had been there ahead of us, probably who I don't know. But <clears throat> we spent the rest of, uh, of 72 there and over the winter. And in October, uh, we didn't have radios in each cell there. They didn't have power like we had back in the big prison. We had these little radios in each room and you got these propaganda broadcast. Uh, uh, Hanoi Hanna, we call it the voice of Vietnam, all the garbage. Up here, they had to do it by quizzes. And <clears throat> one of the fellows that went early, picked up, they were asking him, what do you think about this proposed end of the war or whatever? This is in early October. And then I was called out right at the end of October. And he asked me, he said, uh, are you disappointed there was no settlement in October? I said, no, I didn't know there were going to be one, so how can I be disappointed for something I didn't know was going to happen, going to happen anyway? And kind of went on with that. And then, over Christmas and the holiday and New Year's, it got really cold and we were settling in. All of us were looking to be there in the winter. And one night, uh, the building I was in up the top of the hill, one of the fellows woke us up and said, we just had three trucks come into camp. So we all stayed up and we counted 17 trucks. You don't need that many to bring in a month's load of food. <laughs> Something is up. And the guards came around that morning and let us out to go out to, to, to eat or to shave, whatever we were gonna do. We had a little area, kind of a little patio we could get out to in our building. And, he leans, he looks around at one of the other guys and he does this. And then he comes back like that. Looks up, something is really up here. <laughs> so we went back in and just so we didn't miss out on it, we all started rolling up our gear. <laughs> and that afternoon when the guard came around and opened it up and he gives us this, which was a signal to roll up, ready to move, 
we just all leaned over and patted our roll. <laughs> he got a big smile on his face, and right after dark, they loaded us on the trucks, headed back to Hanoi, and about halfway down mid-afternoon, we stopped and had a little coffee break. They gave us water and uh, little energy bars, coconut bar stuff. And <clears throat> instead of getting back on the truck necessarily to your own, they divided us out in four categories. And what turned out to be the first two release groups went back to the big prison. The third release group went to the one we called a plantation, and the fourth one went to the zoo. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we'd been back about a week, and I was at the plantation in the third group. And they called us out one afternoon. We lined up, and the camp commander came over, and he read us the protocol from the uh, Paris Treaty that, that in itself required that the prisoners be notified within 48 hours of this date. And they were told it, and they stood there for a few minutes uh, waiting for us to do something, and when we didn't, they said, okay, dismissed, and we all filed back into our own little cells, and then we went up hugging each other. So, God, God, I hope it's true, hope it's true. And in my particular case, uh, I was pulled out and taken up to Wallow. It turns out that after the first release group, there was a little difference of opinion between, oh, and the conditions for release were that everybody would be released in four equal in increments over the next 60 days. So, the and with the sick and wounded being released first. Well, the U.S. expected that to be release the sick and wounded, then four more increments. The Vietnamese interpreted it be the sick and wounded would be in the first increment. So they had a little hassle about that. And somehow they came up and released 20 guys, just pulled almost at random, came out. So as that was going on, I was pulled up to the second release group. Then they decided, no, the count didn't work. So I went back to the plantation. <laughs> And then they pulled me out again. And whatever the problem was, we were supposed to be released on the 1st of March. And the camp commander came in, and we had the big you know, going away thing, special dinner, blah, 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 on the night of last night in February. And then he told us, he said, maybe you do not go tomorrow. There is a small problem. I will let you know. So the next morning he comes in and said, I don't think so today. And that night he said, maybe tomorrow. And then by, by March the 3rd, we were said, oh, oh, to hell with it. I hope somebody got out of here anyway. And he came in that night and he says, I think tomorrow, okay. And sure enough, the next morning he comes in and came in. There was a group called, a, I forget the exact name, but there were an Indian, a Canadian, a... Uh, Czech and another Soviet Union type had to come around and inspect everybody. So they came through. We figured, mm, I think we might make it today. <laughs> and sure enough, about an hour later, we started going out. Uh, we got our go-home clothes that we'd been fitted for. We went out to pick them up, put them on. And they walked us out the front gate, and they had their little 20 uh, seat buses out there, and we all got on and headed over to the GLM for the big trip home. Well, we got out there as we pulled out onto the ramp that I saw that 141 out there. Of course, working out there, my neighbor at uh, at Craig had gotten out of the Air Force and was test pilot in 141, and I'd walked out into one just for a left to go to Southeast Asia. And when I saw that airplane, the United States of America, and that big flag up there, and I told a lot of people, when I walked down and walked up that ramp, I could smell the red clay out of North Georgia. I knew I was going home. Is that uh, just an expression, or did you really feel like you smelled? I, mean, I, you, you I, I started feeling like I'm headed home, yeah. Well, the, the one question I want to ask you, the, the penultimate next to the last, is a lot of things changed for you. 
mm. while you were a prisoner, you found out about losing your father and losing other family members and your wife. And again, I, you know, I, if you don't mind my asking, what sustained you through that? Well, I had premonitions or, or indications, I guess you'd say, on both. I only got two letters from my wife, and they were there, and they were six lines, but she only used about four of them. So all she just said was, "The children are fine; they help a lot." Another one was, "I moved to Atlanta uh, to go to Emory; the children are doing well." You, know, it, you, you could almost read into it the indifference. And in the case of my dad, uh, the one thing that I got from my mother was a birthday card. It was signed "Love Mother," and that was probably one of the really low points when I realized he was gone because I was looking forward to, to seeing him. I knew he was in bad shape when I left, but uh, I was looking forward to going back and seeing him again. And so when I got there to Clark, we'd been there, I don't know, three or four hours, and uh, they came around and got me and said, there's a colonel up here who wants to see you. And he introduced himself from, from 13th Air Force headquarters. <clears throat> and he, we were standing in the doorway to the little ward area that I was in, and I looked up, and the technician that had been seeing me around was leaned up to the desk up here about 20, 30 feet. And I don't know why I turned around, there was another technician back standing around over here. I was, this is not going to be a standard conversation. <laughs> what is it? So he started out casually, he told me about my aunt dying and my uncle dying, and my father-in-law dying, and then your father died, and then your wife got a divorce. And as I've described it, it wasn't a surprise, it was the shock of confirmation. The things I was hoping weren't true, but I had a sense. And it was kind of ironic when I learned about more detail about my wife's divorce. When I was up in the mountains, and I hadn't gotten anything, heard anything. I went to a quiz and I asked an officer whom I'd known from way back at the zoo. I said, I hadn't heard anything from my wife in a long time. I said, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe something has happened. I said, no, I think everything's fine. And I said, well, I said, I would really like to know. I don't want my children to be in hurting or having any problem. He said, okay, I ask. And several months later, I went to quiz with him again. And he said, I ask. He said, I think everything okay. As it turns out, that first quiz was within a week of when she filed for the divorce, and the second one was within a week of when it was granted. And they had sent it over, sent the paperwork to Hanoi to camp a detention. And since I didn't reply within 30 days, I wasn't contesting it. <laughs> Well, I was still going through the checkout down at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama, but my mother wanted to get the family together at home and visit. And so I came up, flew up commercially, and my ex-wife was here in town at the time. She came out and picked me up at the airport and we went over to her house and we were talking, I was gonna take my children out with me for this party. And we were sitting there talking and she said, how you plan on getting to Bremen? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Thought it didn't cross my mind. <laughs> oh, well, I'll rent a car. Oh, no, I guess I can't do that. I don't have a driver's license. Hmm. Why? I didn't think I'd ride the bus. I don't know, because that'd be right off the bat. I thought, well, maybe Pat will, will uh, rent me an airplane, because I had a pilot's license, commercial license. And I wasn't thinking of the fact that you got to have a medical to make it effective. But she said, well, you better do something. So this is getting kind of late if you're going out there tomorrow. So I called him up. I don't know. I guess we were looking at the phone book. I got him at home. And I said, hey, you got any airplane you might rent out tomorrow? <laughs> he says, what for? I said, well, I need to get out to Bremen with me and the children. He said, when do you want to go? And I said, oh, sometime mid-morning or so. He says, hold on a minute. Looked around and he said, how's about 10 o'clock? Would that be good, 10.30? I said, yeah, it'd be fine. So he said, well, you know how to get out to my place? And I said, yeah. He said, all right, I'll see you then. So we come driving up out here, and it turns out 
he had a demonstration set up for a hope for sale with a King Air, I think it was. Uh, anyways, about an eight or ten place airplane. And this company, people were here and they were really nice working with Sin. And said, yeah, we'll be glad. And they gave me a ride out to West Georgia Airport and my brother was there to pick me up. But Pat and I have laughed about that a lot of times. Those six years of your life that you gave, literally gave to this country, uh, and all that happened to you, what, what would you say to young people? Or what, what would you, if you could get them all to pay attention to you for the next minute, what would you say? Well, first I would say that I'm proud of my service. At the time I was there, I honestly believed that we were doing something that needed to be done because the threat of communism and the expansion of China and their efforts to, particularly in, in Asia and in Southeast Asia, uh, could have had very difficult future. And while we did not win, and unfortunately I think I have to say we, we gave, we actually did win the combat. Our politicians gave it away later on. But we did accomplish a, a uh, stalemate, so to speak, and I think we stopped that expansion, gave those countries a chance to get on a little firmer basis. As far as Vietnamese people, I was disappointed for them, the boat people, that, that many were killed and died in the process of getting out of there, and in Cambodia that were literally killed during the Pol Pot regime. Uh, I, I don't think we can take any pride at all in allowing that to happen, but when we finally started recognizing the Vietnamese, I was asked by one of the local stations, what do you think about it with the trade and then the recognition? And I said, well, we went over there to give them a chance for self-determination, and it looks like they're finally going to get it. And on the two trips I've made back over there, I think we really did win the hearts and minds because they really like Americans there now. But for the status now and the condition in the future of this country, I have real concern. Uh, the last few years, uh, the mood of the country, the culture of the country, society have changed in ways that I cannot say that I feel proud about. But I do talk to enough young people who have good attitudes and good patriotic values that I'm optimistic that they will rise to the top and be the cream of the crop and we'll get this country back on track someday. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.